Right. Uh, welcome to World Soil Day in Harvard Square, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, December 5th, 2016. It's an important day for, for the world, although we don't hear very much about World Soil Day. Uh, world Soil Day here, this event is sponsored by Soil for Climate, a nonprofit organization, uh, Green Cambridge, another nonprofit organization, and the Soil Carbon Alliance, a third nonprofit organization. Um, and we're happy to talk to you here today about restoring soils to reverse global warming and specifically how it can be done in time to prevent the disastrous effects of runaway climate change. So uh, I'm Tom Garreau from the Soil Carbon Alliance and um, what's very interesting to me about soils is how little attention soils get. This is the first event we've had here in Cambridge. There are very few around the world. Um, World Soil Day is a worldwide event. Uh, you'd think there'd be more attention to it. But when you think about it, soils are the ecosystem that provide our food. They support, they have about five times more carbon in soils than there are in the atmosphere or in the biosphere. About 99% of the biomass of soils, as I said, are the most essential ecosystem we have. We depend on them for all our living resources, but we treat them like dirt. We regard them as an unclean subject. It's not fit to discuss. Politicians never mention the importance of soil. Soils are not mentioned in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The word soils doesn't even appear in the convention, even though, as I say, they have five times more carbon in soils than are in the atmosphere. And it's the only possible place we can store the excess carbon in time to prevent runaway climate change, but it's not mentioned in the treaty at all. Soil science, you would think that understanding this ecosystem, which is so essential to everything, all forms of life on Earth, or almost all forms of life on Earth, would be fundamental to our education, that people would learn about the importance of soils. It's a living ecosystem created by roots and interaction with the rocks. You'd think we would be learning about to understand how to ma maintain that and under you know, improve it. But soil science is not included in education programs anywhere. Here in Cambridge, Harvard and MIT, two of the top universities in the world, have never had a soil scientist on their faculty. It's not regarded as a subject of serious scientific interest, despite its importance. That's really incredible when you think about it. And the fact that there's so much widespread ignorance about soils is one of the things that is holding us back from recognizing their importance. I've shown this before in other talks, but this is one of my favorite places in Jamaica. This is the island I come from, and this is a cave I've known since I was a little boy. And this cave here overlooks the sea. And Marked here, you can see in the rocks, is the ancient sea level from about 120 to 130,000 years ago, which is the last interglacial period, the last time that global climate was 1 to 2 degrees Celsius warmer than today. And at that time, sea level was right up here. This was the notch. The corals that grew below sea level below it, below it, and today's sea level is 7 or 8 meters lower than today, nearly 25 feet lower than what it is now. At this time, global temperatures I mentioned were about two to three degrees, uh, one to two degrees C warmer. Sea level was seven or eight meters higher. There are hippopotamuses and crocodiles in London, England at this time. And yet CO2 was only 270 parts per million. If we look at the long-term climate records based on ancient sea levels, uh, ancient temperatures, ancient CO2 that are recorded in Antarctic ice cores and deep sea sediments and fossil coral reefs around the world, what we see is that temperature and CO2 go in lockstep. They follow each other. And the point about this location here is we can see the past, the present, and if we know what we're looking at, we can see the future because if CO2 had been 400 parts per million at this time, which is what it is now, sea level would have been way up this cliff way, way up that cliff. If we look at the last nearly a million years of global temperature, sea level and CO2 records from Antarctic ice cores is a clear relationship. The more CO2, the higher the temperature. Now, if we take a look at today's temperature, which is over here, and then compare what temperature should we get for a CO2 level that we have now, 400 parts per million, 
What the data actually shows, a million years of long-term climate records, is that the long-term equilibrium temperature should be about 17 degrees C higher than it is today. And the sea level should be about 23 meters higher than it is today for today's level of CO2, 400 parts per million. Now, let's ask what is a safe level of CO2 for today's climate, and the answer is we can see that here. The safe level in terms of global temperature and sea level is about 260 parts per million. In other words, we are already 40% too high in terms of CO2 to stabilize climate at the present level. But we have not yet felt the impacts of the CO2 we have in the atmosphere. And that's something that very few people seem to understand, but it's really crucial. It takes 1,600 years for the ocean to turn over. The deep sea is just above freezing temperatures. It's extremely cold, and until the deep sea, which holds about 95% of the heat in the climate system, until that warms up, we will not feel the full effect of warming at the surface of the Earth. So when we change CO2 and have it increase, there's a couple thousand years time lag before global temperature responds. And that is something the politicians are not aware of. And the long term, I say equilibrium temperature and sea level for today's 400 ppm is 17 degrees warmer and 23 meters higher. We haven't felt that yet because we haven't yet begun to feel the impacts. It's going to take thousands of years, but they will, will happen, and that's what we have to prevent. So the safe level, as I say, is about 206 p ppm. We're already at 400. That means we have to reduce atmospheric CO2 by about 140 parts per million. Emissions reduction simply can't do the job. If we stop all fossil fuel emissions overnight, the excess CO2 is going to remain in the atmosphere for centuries. The high temperatures and high CO2 levels will remain for hundreds of thousands of years, if not millions of years. The only way to reduce that CO2 is to increase the natural sinks of CO2, to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and store them safely in the soil. So increasing the sinks is essential, but that sinks are not mentioned in the Climate Change Convention. They only talk about sources, so it's a completely unbalanced picture. Soils are the only sink, the only place where we can store that carbon quickly enough to make a difference and to prevent the catastrophic effects of the runaway global warming that will certainly happen if we don't act. It's very important to understand that CO2 temperature and sea level rise we have all, if we don't remove the excess CO2 we've already put into the atmosphere, it'll take millions of years for that to go away because that CO2 will cycle through the system and only over a million years of period will be eventually buried in the rocks as fossil organic carbon and limestone. It's a very slow process. Every single time in the past that we have had super greenhouse effects due to high CO2, and this has happened several times in the geological past, Global temperatures have gotten anywhere from 15 to 20 degrees or 25 degrees C warmer than they are today. And when that has happened, all the coral reefs in the world died, and it took anywhere from 4 to 25 million years before they recovered afterwards. So we're set in motion with the excess CO2 we've already put into the atmosphere, our long-term climate change that will last for millions of years if we don't act to reduce excess CO2 in the atmosphere. So what we're talking about is what we call geotherapy, the restoration of our planet's natural life support systems, the natural mechanisms that regulate CO2 temperature and sea level at safe levels, and a lot of that is through storage of carbon in the soil. So we need to accurately diagnose the sources and sinks of carbon and figure out where we can store it in order to prescribe, a, a, how can I say, a course to restore the patient to health. The Earth is very sick because of excess CO2. We're running at extreme high temperature, and we need to reduce it. The concept of geotherapy was developed around 1990 by the late Richard Grantham, who was a pioneer in molecular biology based in Lyon, France, uh, who is now dead, unfortunately. And he organized the first international geotherapy conference in Lyon in 1990, where I spoke on stabilizing CO2 in the atmosphere. And he was inspired by this paper that I wrote in 1987 called The Other Half of the Global Carbon Dioxide Problem, which is the first paper to point out 
that the only way that we could prevent the effects of runaway climate change is to store that excess CO2 in the vegetation, in the soil, particularly in the tropics. And if we did that quickly enough, we could prevent the effects of runaway CO2. So that was inspiration for what the geotherapy movement. And it also, in effect, was the first statement of the principle of regenerative development to reverse climate change. It was speeding up the growth and the storage of biological systems that pull carbon CO2 out of the atmosphere and store it in the biosphere and in soils where it's safe instead of up in the atmosphere where it's dangerous. So we've been working on this for quite a number of years and a lot of the, this is outlined in the book on geotherapy which was published in 2014, 600 pages and it has something, it has chapters from almost from every single continent in the world, except Antarctica, of people using extremely innovative methods to increase the fertility of their soils and increase carbon storage on their land in every single ecosystem and soil type. People have worked this out in every habitat, how to do this, and they're mostly people, farmers, who want to produce more on their land, and they figure out they do so by recycling everything very intensively and make it more productive instead of losing, losing carbon from their land, they're growing carbon on their land. And that's also called carbon farming. It's a very important concept. Now the fact is, is that we only have about a quarter of the Earth's surface that we can practice carbon farming on. The Earth is about 70% ocean, and it's got areas of ice and snow and dry land and so forth that are in mountains that aren't covered, don't have soil. So we've got about a quarter of the Earth available. And We've got to focus on the land because the productivity on the land is vastly greater than the ocean. When people talk about fertilizing the sea to store carbon, they're talking nonsense. The oceans simply don't produce enough carbon or store enough carbon. And the, the carbon that gets stored, for instance, in these high spots of productivity in the Amazon or New Guinea or Indonesia, a lot of that carbon is being pulled out of the atmosphere and put into trees that are lasting for hundreds of years, storing that carbon. And then it goes into the soil for longer. But in the ocean, that carbon gets put into, not into trees that last hundreds of years, it goes into single-celled phytoplankton that die within about a couple days. They get eaten by viruses or zooplankton eat them, and they go right back into CO2. So they don't store CO2 in the water at all. So the ocean is not an effective solution. We have to focus on the land where we can increase the productivity effectively. <clears throat> in the ocean, there's a great deal of carbon cycling, but very little gets stored out of the bottom. So it's not an effective solution. We have to focus on the land because the ocean becomes efficient as a carbon sink only under one condition, and that's when we turn it into a dead zone. When we remove all the oxygen, so it stinks of hydrogen sulfide, of rotten eggs, and under those conditions, when there's no oxygen in the water, then the organic matter will pile up on the bottom because it doesn't decompose. That's the only way to turn it into a carbon sink, is to kill it. So that's not a desirable alternative. It's one that's happened in the past. In times in the past when we had super greenhouse effects, where the world got very hot, the oceans lost their oxygen, and they turned into stinking dead zones full of organic matter, and that eventually drew down the CO2 in the atmosphere. That's not the option we were proposing here. We, we think the more effective solution is to store it on land much more quickly because the ocean solution would take millions of years to come into effect. So we can't really affect the ocean here. There's a lot of CO2 going in and out of the ocean, but we can't affect the winds and the waves that are what control that change, and we can store very little. Where we can make a difference is on land. Instead of managing the land in such a way that we're destroying the forest and putting more CO2 into the atmosphere, we need to manage so we're increasing photosynthesis and storing more carbon in the soil, which is, as I say, about five times more than there is CO2 in the atmosphere or in the biosphere. So increasing soil carbon is the only way really we can hope to get out of this more quickly than waiting millions of years for it to pile up in the ocean. Originally, our carbon cycles were in balance. Pre-industrial, the global carbon cycle was balanced. Photosynthesis removed CO2, it was returned by respiration decomposition, and stored in soil organic carbon, and all of these were pretty stable. When 10,000 years ago, when we began the agricultural revolution, we started cutting down the soil, and what that did is we export the carbon as food, 
We oxidize the soil carbon, it washes away in erosion, it decomposes because of increased temperature and decomposition. And so we've lost the, most of our soil carbon, and that's gone into the atmosphere. Worldwide, as a matter of fact, we've destroyed about half of the biosphere, we've destroyed about half of the forested habitats, and we've lost about half of the carbon in those habitats that was in that soil, has been simply oxidized away and lost to the atmosphere because of bad land management. This is what we call degenerative land management, and it's what almost everybody does. They're running down the land, they're running down the carbon capital of the soil in order to export small amounts of carbon as crops. So that's not working. That's a part of the root of the problem. What we need to do is change degenerative land management into restorative development. And this is restorative agriculture or carbon farming in such a way that we're increasing productivity, increasing the biomass. We're producing food at the same time that we're exporting, but we're able to store more organic soil organic carbon and adding biochar which as i mentioned is a one unique form of carbon that lasts a very long time and by doing that we can in fact increase soil carbon and pull co2 down out of the atmosphere the trees are in effect a machine that removes co2 from the atmosphere if we manage them right and that's what we call restorative de development or geotherapy storing co2 in the soil is the only way we know to reduce co2 to safe levels fast enough to prevent the devastating effects of what is going to happen over the next few thousands of years. And IPCC is ignored because their projections only go for the next 10, 20, or 100 years, so they miss 90% of the response. This has given people a false sense of security because IPCC is only reporting the very initial part of a change that is going to continue for thousands of thousands of years, but which is not included in their mandate to predict. Okay, they're missing almost all the response. So we need to focus on soil carbon, which is not mentioned in the Climate Change Convention. And in fact, we need to increase soil carbon by only about 8% to absorb all the excess CO2 in the atmosphere and stabilize climate at safe levels. So that, in my view, is doable. Let's talk a little bit about how that can be done. I call that carbon trading that solves the problem. This is the amount of carbon in the atmosphere the green part is a safe content, the red part is a dangerous excess we need to get rid of. We need to remove from this level down to that. And that we need to do, that means we need to remove this excess carbon into vegetation and then store it in the soil. And the soil only needs to increase a relatively small amount. And the question now is, can that be done quickly enough to solve the problem and to make a difference? Well, soil, as I mentioned, is crucial to productivity. The fertility of the soil is directly proportional to the organic carbon and the nutrients that are in the soil. This is one of the richest soils in the world in Kansas, very productive. Here's a farmer with his crop and with his soil. And the darker the soil in general, the higher the organic content and the richer it is. Here's another soil in Syria. And you can see this soil, it's not nearly as dark, a lot drier. He can hardly produce anything on this. There's an even more infertile soil also in Syria, paler red soil. And here finally in Africa is a soil that has almost no color at all, in Niger. This is a soil that has hardly any organic matter or nutrients in the soil and you can produce very little in it. So in, in order to, we need to do carbon farming and that's applicable in all soil types. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit, but the key is that we need to increase productivity in every one of these habitats by introducing the methods of restorative agriculture, restorative development, and carbon farming. And the thing about that is when we increase the carbon in those soils, we not only increase the productivity, we greatly increase the water soil holding capacity. So that means water, instead of rushing off the soil in the rainy season, now gets stored in the ground. The growing season becomes much longer. And we're able to produce much more food. And we're able to produce biomass that can produce carbon negative energy as well. I'll show you how we do that in a minute with biochar, but now we can use that biomass to produce energy and remove CO2 from the atmosphere at the same time. But we can only do that with large scale environmental restoration. Um, this is the French four per 1000 proposal. And this is a very important proposal. This is the first time any government ever proposed to include soil in the Climate Change Convention. It was done by the French government last year, 
in Paris at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. On December 1st last year, the French proposed that soil carbon be accounted for, that governments account for the carbon they have in the soil and try to systematically increase it by 0.4% per year. And the idea of the French proposal was essentially to stop the increase of CO2 at level that off. So that idea of the increasing of four parts per thousand was to prevent the increase. It was not to reduce it to safe levels. It needs to be more ambitious. It was simply to reduce the increase. And the French then proposed that on December 1st in the Framework Convention on Climate Change. This is a map of what they suggest the carbon sequestration rate would be needed worldwide. And if you look at the numbers here closely, most of these numbers here, I mean, only the darkest blue is more than one ton of carbon per hectare per year. Most of these rates here are, you know, a tenth of a carbon per hectare per year are very low. And they say this would be enough to stabilize that. But as you can see, the blue areas that they're proposing for hard carbon sequestration are very strange. Greenland ice caps, ice caps in, in Siberia, North America, tundra. And these are areas that are, you know, hardly likely to be increasing carbon. In fact, as they warm up, they're going to be losing carbon at a very rapid rate. They're proposing very high, high rates of carbon sequestration for the Andes, for the Ethiopian mountains, and for the Himalaya mountains in Tibet. So this is a very strange distribution. It doesn't seem to me one that you could easily acquire. The principle is right. But the French propose this at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change on December 1st last year. On December 10th, they withdrew that proposal. They withdrew the proposal because it was clear that a lot of governments, in particular, I would say the United States, Russia, and the OPEC countries, made clear they would not agree to any form of carbon accounting in soils or carbon accounting at all. And the French, therefore, on December 10th, in the United Nations Permanent Convention on Climate Change in Paris, withdrew their proposal that countries be required to be mandated to monitor and increase their soil carbon, and it turned into a voluntary proposal on December 10th. And 37 countries signed up in Paris, almost all members of the French-speaking community, the former French colonies in Africa and other countries where French is the national language, and a lot of the EU countries signed, but it was voluntary, it had no force of law. Since Paris, not a single country has signed up to this, and none of them have pursued it in any serious way. So because it's voluntary, it had no force of mandate of law. Now, on December 1st, however, the French proposal was still on the table in Paris. And on December 5th, which is World Soil Day last year in 2015, I went to the FAO booth in Paris at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change because the World Soil Day was, is an FAO event. And not only that, last year, 2015, was the FAO Year of the Soil. So last year, on December 5th, was World Soil Day in the World Year of the Soil, both of which were events that were sponsored by the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. So I went to the FAO information, information booth on World Soil Day and World Soil Year in the middle of the Climate Change Convention to find out what events they were holding about World Soil Day to find out there was none at all. And there was not a single mention that either World Soil Day or World Year of the Soil were then in any of the brochures, the newsletters, the posters, the videos, the books, or any of the material they're passing out. It wasn't even mentioned at all. It was not mentioned at all by FAO at the Framework Convention of Climate. So governments have ignored it. They've really literally ignored soils as not part of the picture. It's a disastrous problem. But uh, it's a very serious omission. And in fact, it means a framework convention on climate change cannot possibly meet its own goals until it's made scientifically sound to include all the major sources and sinks of carbon that are honestly accounted for. So the French soil proposal, unfortunately, um, got stepped down to voluntary proposal and hasn't been followed through. This year, the Commonwealth Secretariat which is the Commonwealth Secretariat of Nations, which is the governments of 52 countries with 2.5 billion people, including all the English-speaking countries of the world except for the United States of America, 
those 52 countries with 2.5 billion people committed themselves to a program of restorative development to reverse climate change. They didn't put any formal written proposals at UNFCC this year in Marrakesh on that. So we have to wait to see what develops. That program will not be announced until June of this year, and then we'll see what kind of funding is meant to go into it. But my understanding is that they are very serious about moving ahead now with increasing carbon and restoring ecosystems, increasing carbon and soil for action to reverse global warming now without waiting for other countries to go ahead. I think we're at the beginnings of a situation where the world is going to begin to move those countries that are ready to move ahead and those that aren't are just we're just going to have to wait for another four years for them to to join the rest of the world so we are beginning to see now finally the beginnings of political movement as a result of the commonwealth initiative now where we need to focus our efforts obviously we got to restore soil forest cover we've lost about half the forests in the world huge areas of asia and Asia and Europe and North America and Africa have lost all their forest. So we're wiping that area out and not only have we lost all that carbon in the biosphere, we've lost half the carbon that was in the soil of those areas that were degraded and converted to agriculture and pasture. These are the agriculture and pasture lands of the soil, agriculture in green and pasture in, in, uh, in red. And you can see that's most of the world has been converted to some form of human use and we're running down the carbon in all of the soils in all of these areas. So almost all of these areas of agriculture and soils and pasture soils are severely degraded and have lost half or more of their soil carbon and their nutrients. So our focus needs to be to restore the fertility of these soils to turn them from what they are now, which is CO2 sources of the atmosphere, into CO2 sinks. So if we take a look at crop yields worldwide, these are crop yields from agriculture and pastures. In general, we're talking about only about one or two tons of carbon per hectare per year in most of the world. In the highest areas, like in Europe or North America or Japan, with this intensive agriculture that's fed by chemicals, you're getting up to about 10 tons of carbon per hectare per year. And that's the increase of the biomass mass in the crops. But at the same time, while we're adding you know, maybe a ton or so per hectare per year worldwide, we're losing carbon from the soil at a vastly greater rate. This scale here is, is 200 tons of carbon per hectare per year. The other one was 10. What we were gaining here, we're losing far, far more. And the, the fact is that through bad soil management, almost every part of the world is losing more soil to the atmosphere from loss of soil carbon than it is from the productivity of the, the crops above them. So that we need to reverse. Again, we have the techniques to do that. And restorative development to reverse climate change can be applied to all of these soils, turning them into carbon sinks and making them from part of the problem into part of the solution. So to be effective at reducing the dangerous excess of CO2 in time, to prevent runaway climate change, we need to increase both the total amount of carbon we're removing from the atmosphere and storing in the soil, the quantity, but we also need to increase the quality in terms of how long it remains stored, how long it remains out of the atmosphere and stored in the soil and the biosphere. So how fast we can do it is a matter of quantity, quality, and the duration of the carbon storage. I want to look at that now, to, at this point, to look at what is feasible and how we can do this. This is a study published this year by Eric Tonsmeyer, and he's, it's a book on carbon farming, and he's summarized all of the data that he could find on carbon sequestration, tons of carbon per hectare per year, as a function of different kinds of land management. It's very instructive to look at that. Over here on the left are annual crops, the crops we grow, we plant every year and harvest and cut down. And you can see at best we're getting around you know, two tons of carbon per hectare per year with, with fairly big error bars. But that's about the amount we get. On the other hand, if we have annual crops with trees, and that's here in dark blue, you can see we get about twice as much carbon stored per hectare per year. So the trees make a huge difference.
Over here, we have livestock and pasture. These are grazing animals eating grass or grass being fed to the animals. And once again, the productivity there is a couple, a range of about two hectares per year average. It varies from place to place. That's typical. If we add trees, it goes way up. Way, way up. So that makes a huge difference. It makes the land more productive. It stores more carbon. It shades the soil. Etc. Etc. Restores the water. Huge benefits. Over here we have perennial crops. These are herbaceous crops, things like bananas and sugarcane, or or grass crops that are growing continually year after year, not annual crops. Well, those store about twice as much carbon as annual crops. Perennial crops make a big difference. They're storing the nutrients all the time because it's always living bio biomass on the soil. Leaving the soil bare is the worst thing you can do. So that helps. But these are just bare herbaceous crops. So not bare herbaceous, herbaceous crops, monoculture herbaceous crops. If we grow biomass crops, which are trees and grass that are made for the purpose of producing carbon as quickly as we can, we get a lot more productivity similar to trees. And these are tree crops of all sorts, but grown as single species, monoculture. So again, there we're getting considerably higher storage. But over here, the highest of all, are polyculture trees, where we're growing many different tree species together. They stimulate each other, and we wind up with the greatest carbon storage of all. So we have a big range. The key thing that we learn here is trees greatly increase carbon removal and carbon storage in all ecosystems, and perennial crops greatly increase. And so if we add trees to the mixture, we can greatly increase carbon storage in any ecosystem. That's a very, very important point, and it needs to be applied. Now, if we compare the different carbon removal rates here, I'm going to classify them as follows. Very low being about one ton of carbon per hectare per year, which is, you know, typical agricultural practice in most of the world. Low being about five, which is, you know, not very high. Ten, I'm going to count as medium, which is the best agriculture that we know of, and sort of low monoculture. Uh, and then I'm going to count as high 25, and very high is 50. 25, as you'll see, are rates that the best people routinely get, and 50 is beyond the state of the art that we have available now. Here's all the data that Tonesmeyer tabulated here from all these different forms of land management. As you can see, the very highest are not, don't make it up to 50. But the point is, is there are plenty of people who are up here in the high range here. Most people are down here at the low range. So we're going to look at what the effects are of storing carbon at the range of 1, 5, 10, 25, and 50 tons per hectare per year worldwide over the land surface and ask how quickly we can draw down the excess CO2. So that depends on the rate drawdown rates and how much of that carbon is stored long term in the soil as opposed to oxidized and recycled. I'm going to show you some calculations based on that. And this shows the time it takes to eliminate that excess 140 ppm from the atmosphere, the time it takes in years. This is a logarithmic scale, as you notice. And this is a function of the rate of carbon drawdown. If we increase the global average rate of drawdown by one ton per hectare per year, it'll take us thousands of years to remove that excess. Now, if we take a typical forest and we let it burn down, there's a forest fire, sweeps of forest, 99% of that carbon goes off as CO2, and about 1% remains as charcoal or as, uh, uh, that remains in the soil. And that's what we call the long-lived carbon. Forest fires are very inefficient at producing long-lived carbon, only about 1%. So if we're producing only about 1%, and if we, if we cut down the tree and mulch it and put it into the ground, again, most of that carbon is going to decompose over after a few years, only a small proportion is going to remain in the soil. The long-lived carbon is a really key part, and the charcoal is, is one form of that. Now, if we were only storing 1% of the carbon as long-lived carbon, and we were doing at higher than the highest possible rate of carbon sequestration, it would still take us many decades to remove the excess CO2. That's, that's utterly impossible, as you can see. You know, but. The point is, we can't possibly be drawing down carbon. Realistically, we're lucky to be able to be down here. The point is, we can't draw down the carbon quickly enough to make a difference unless we increase the percentage of long-lived carbon in the soil. 
And if we go from 1% to 5% or 10% long-lived carbon or biochar or charcoal from the biosphere we produce, then we can stabilize climate at safe levels in decades. That then becomes possible. So we, you know, it's not possible unless we increase carbon drawdown and long-lived carbon. Long-lived carbon is really, really critical, but it is possible to do it if we increase both. We have only a short window of time to do this, and we're going to have to focus on the things that work the best. So we've got to basically try to produce about 10% long-lived carbon at rates of carbon sequestration that are fairly typical of moderate rates. One, five, or 10 tons of carbon per hectare per year. That's easily done. 25 is the state of the art, 50 is a little above performance, but if we're sequestering, say, 5 or 10 tons of carbon per hectare per year, and only about 10% of that goes into long-lived carbon, then we're now, now a, in a situation where we can get rid of the excess CO2 in decades and solve the problem and prevent runaway climate change. So that's really crucial. Um, it's very crucial to be able to do both. So. Let's ask what we can do with long-lived carbon. There are two critical leverage points of long-lived carbon that are very different forms that I want to focus on. The first is what we call biochar, which is like a form of high-temperature charcoal that is very res resistant to decomposition. I'll come back to that. And the other are wetland soils. I mean, in the case of biochar, the carbon lasts almost forever because it's very resistant to decomposition. In the case of wetlands, the carbon lasts for thousands of years because it's an environment without oxygen with very low decomposition. So they're two different categories, but both of these produce soils that can be up to half carbon in content. These are the most carbon-rich soils in the world are biochar and wetland soils. <clears throat> the biochar technology was invented by the Indians in Amazonia thousands of years ago, and they created the most fertile soils in the world in the midst of the poorest soils in the world in the Amazon forest. The terra preta soil is black or dark brown, and the reason is it's anywhere from 10 to 50 percent charcoal by weight. The Indians in ancient times would burn the trees, make charcoal, and put it into the ground where it held on to the nutrients that they added from fish bones and, and uh, agricultural wastes and other things they threw into the soil, and that created this incredibly rich soil that's loaded with charcoal. Now, and this charcoal lasts essentially forever. If you make it under low temperature conditions, it only might last you know, decades to hundreds of years. If you make it under high temperature conditions, it lasts for hundreds of millions of years. That, that's carbon that's essentially stored forever. So this is a very effective thing. It can be done in every habitat. And wherever you do it, the biochar retains the nutrients and retains the, the water in the soil and then it allows the mycorrhizae, the symbiotic fungi with the roots of the plants to grow into that and transfer the nutrients to the plant. So it makes a very productive, intensely recycling ecosystem. <clears throat> Biochar is not a fertilizer per se, it's just charcoal. You have to add the missing nutrients to it in terms of rock powders or compost. This is a project we did in Panama, in the poorest soils in Panama, where we simply added basalt powder and that replaced all the missing elements that the soils lacked, except for nitrogen, and we're able to get trees to grow, as you can see, about eight times faster. We didn't have biochar available. By adding biochar and rock powder and compost, we can produce extremely mature, carbon-rich soils that retain the carbon essentially forever and greatly increase forest, agricultural, and pasture productivity. And this can be, these can be applied in any habitat this is a map of soil organic carbon. So instead of losing it, we could be adding it by essentially converting a, the weedy, invasive biomass that has taken over abandoned lands, converting that to biochar, and then growing good fruit and wood trees in their place. So we can convert biomass that has no use and uh, land that has no use into rich land that produces useful trees. So there's plenty of opportunity to increase biochar, and that can be done in any habitat. Now, of the soil organic carbon, I'll come back to this a little later, half of that, of that carbon in soils, is in wetlands. And half of that wetland carbon is in marine wetlands. 
And that, by that I mean saltwater plant communities like mangroves, seagrass, and salt marshes that grow along the coasts of the world. You don't even see that on this map because they occupy only about 1% of the surface of the Earth. <clears throat> okay, so we can put biochar in all soils, but we only have about 1% that's mangrove, salt marsh, and seagrass, and we can build incredibly rich carbon habitats there because their peat soils can be nearly pure organic matter. The coastal wetlands store about half of all the carbon in the ocean, even though they occupy only about 1% of the Earth. So they're really crucial habitats. They're ignored by the people on land, they're ignored by the people at the sea, and worse, we're destroying them rapidly. We're wiping them out as fast as we can. We've destroyed about half of them or more already. So they're critical for shore protection, they're critical for all fish nursery habitat all around the world. They're the richest in carbon, but we're deforesting them, draining them, and destroying them as quickly as we can. This is an example from the Everglades. The Everglades was a huge wetland swamp full of black, carbon-rich, organic matter soil. And what they did is they drained it in order to plant crops on top of it. And what happened simply is when they drained it, the carbon that was now exposed to oxygen oxidized and decomposed and disappeared. Here's a concrete stake driven down to bedrock, and that's where it was in, the soil level was in 1927. Here it is in 2012. All of that soil has vanished in between, and all that carbon has gone to the atmosphere. And if you look at a cross-section of the Everglades Agricultural District, that, that collapse of the land surface began long before 1927. And in fact, almost all of that peat soil and carbon-rich soil is gone. We're down now at about the last foot of it. It's simply oxidized away. So that's what we're doing worldwide. We need to reverse that pattern because restoring coastal wetlands will store the most carbon for the least money without competing with food production. In fact, it'll increase food production because of how it will stimulate coastal fisheries as nursery grounds for fish and lobsters and crabs and, and everything else and clams. So these areas are really crucial and so we need to be focusing on, on these methods. Now we have developed new methods, I'm not talking about them in this project, using a technology that I'm an inventor of called BioRock. We use mainly for coral reef restoration but we also greatly increase the growth of all marine plants, sea grasses, salt marsh grasses and mangroves and we're able to grow them in places where they can't grow at all. We're able to grow sea grasses on bare rocks where they normally can't grow. We're able to grow salt marsh seaward of the lower limit. All the salt marshes now are eroding away, but we can actually grow them back and extend them seaward. So our method uses very low voltage safe electrical currents and that stimulates incredible growth of the roots and produces very complex ecosystems, crabs, mussels, and everything that live around them. So we now have new methods that allow us to restore these coastal wetlands we're destroying and greatly increase the soil carbon in them. So restorative development to reverse climate change has only a short window of opportunity. We have not yet felt the impacts of global warming. When we do, we're in very serious trouble. We have to try to reduce CO2 before we get hit with that because we are going to lose all the coral reefs of the world in the next few years if we don't. Our only hope to save reefs is to do exactly this, is to put carbon in soil as quickly as we can. Now, in order to be effective, because we've lost so much time already, because the window of opportunity is so short, we are going to have to focus on the most carbon-rich methods and those methods that produce the highest percent of long-lived carbon. And that means we're going to have to really focus our efforts as intense as we can on biochar in every habitat and restoring mangroves, seagrasses, and salt marshes everywhere. That, that's our only real hope, and we need to focus on that as quickly as we can. So the down-to-earth solution to reverse climate change is going to be the task of the whole world for the next century. And if we act quickly and systematically, we can, in fact, prevent runaway climate change. If we wait longer, it's going to be impossible. We're just at the edge where we have to use the best possible methods, and it can still be done. But we've lost a great deal of time. So our view is that we need to reverse climate change. We need to put that dangerous excess CO2 in the atmosphere where it's killing us back into the ground safely where it's going to do the most good in terms of stimulating the productivity of our environment and regulating temperature 
CO2 and sea, and sea level at safe levels. So we ask you all to join the mass underground grassroots restorative development movement to put carbon in the ground every place. And we think that with the Commonwealth Secretariat Initiative, that we're going to start get, getting governments doing this fairly soon. Some governments, like the United States, are not going to join in for the next four years pretty clearly, but they will have to join the rest of the world sooner or later, in my view. The point is, we can't wait for the people who don't understand what's happening. We have to move ahead as quickly as we can because we don't have much time. Thank you.